So we're in the middle of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and actually 8, 9, and 10 is this section where Paul is actually answering a question they had. What about meat that's offered to idols? Is it okay for us to eat that meat? And so back in the day there in Corinth, they would take their meat, they would offer it to their idols, uh, and then afterwards what they would do is they would take it to the marketplace or they would take it to the local temple, uh, whatever. And, uh, and so there was a question, is it okay to eat meat like that? And we've talked about this kind of like, have you guys ever seen the fruit that they offered to these idols? Uh, some of these Buddhist uh, restaurants and, you know, there's an apple there in front of this statue. I mean, you know, is it okay to eat that? And so um, that is a question that they had, and Paul is answering it. He's saying, in all reality, the demon is nothing. Um, and he deals with that in chapter 8, more along just the theological or practical aspect. But, but he says, but if that makes my brother stumble, I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, you can eat that meat. You can have that apple. But if that makes my brother stumble because he just doesn't have a piece about it, then he, whole, he talks about just, I'll deny myself. I won't eat meat. Now, I like meat. I, I like filet mignon. I like carne asada, tri-tip. So imagine if, you know, you, you can't eat meat anymore. That, that would be denying yourself. But you're doing it because of your brother. You're doing it because you love people. And so nine, chapter 9, he talks about that. Chapter 10, he talks about how when we, you know, look at this whole thing, how important it is that we don't fall into the whole idolatry aspect. And Paul's now going to get into that because it's one thing to go to Stater Brothers and buy that meat. It's something completely different to go to the temple, that pagan temple, and eat the meat there. And when you do that, Paul says, now we're talking about some crazy things where they're sacrificing to demons. And so this section right here is kind of a, a tough section to outline. But I want to give you guys a, a couple of things before we dive in. Because whenever I'm teaching the Bible and I'm thinking, Lord, we're probably not dealing with this specific issue. But I, I, Lord, what good is it for them? How can it benefit the people? Well, let me give you three things um, two outlines one is what is the purpose of life you know I was a philosophy major when I went to college and I was asking those questions what is the purpose of life three things number one uh, to exalt God to exalt God number two to edify the church to edify the church and then number three to evangelize the world why do you live why do you live? Is it to make money? Is it to have fun? Is it to get stuff? Why do you live? What, why does your heart beat? You have to know this very clearly. If you don't know the goal, you'll never hit it. And so what you do is in all the decisions you make and all the things you do, you take it through the litmus test. Does it exalt God, what I'm about to do? Does it edify the church? Does it evangelize the world? I want you to look at three verses before we dive in right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, there, notice what it says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so in, in everything you do, everything, eating, drinking, whatever it might be, he says you, you do it all, there's the first point, to the glory of God, you exalt God. Then the second thing, look at verse 23. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. There's that word, edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. And so, again, there's the question. Exalt God, that, that's what I do. And I want to edify the church. Well, it's legal, it's lawful, yeah, but is it helpful to them? You're a husband, you're making your decisions. How does it affect your wife? How does it affect your children? How, the things that we do, I mean, we're constantly cognizant of how it impacts others. You don't want to tear people down, because that's what happens a lot of times. You get these kids, kids and they're put down by their parents their whole life. You know, or a husband sometimes putting down his wife or vice versa. 
And we're going to see that uh, a lot of this, our, our study today, has to do with that. So you're a Christian, but you're not really living for Christ. You're a pastor, you're a leader, and you do something that is not honoring to God. That makes someone fall away. That's what he talked about in chapter 8. They're, 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 they're living their life for God, but the pastor, he did his thing. It was selfish. He stole from the church, whatever it is. And so a, a Christian falls away. But, but then there's this other aspect, and we're going to see it today, where you're not living your life right, and someone who was on their way to being a Christian now chooses not to. Why? Because you made them stumble and that that's the last thing he paul here in this section and i just wanted to make sure at least you got something out of it what's the purpose of life what's the purpose of life make money have fun what's the purpose of life number one exalt god number two edify the church build them up make them strong do things that are good for them and then number three evangelize the world look look what he says here in verse uh, 32 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I please, also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And so you want people to get saved. You know, earlier he talks about if a non-believer invites you over to dinner... You know, you, you, when you want to go, why? So that you can be a witness to them. And so our whole life, I pray that that's what, how your life operates. You know, that, that you want to glorify God, that you want to build up the church, other believers, and that you want to evangelize the world. And so those are three things that come from the text but then when you kind of go through it there's three other things and we'll talk about this as we go but let's begin reading in first corinthians 10 and verse 14 he says therefore my beloved flee from idolatry flee from idolatry you know therefore is a word of application and so when you read the preceding verses you have the example of israel even though they had so many great spiritual experiences, they fell and they died in the wilderness. They didn't reach the promised land. They never really attained the life that God wanted them to attain to. They never really had victorious Christian living. They fell to idolatry. And so he gives the application here. Therefore, my beloved, and just in case you're wondering, Paul here says, I love you. This is not motivated by, you know, some whatever acts I have to grind. I love you. My beloved, therefore my beloved, flee from idolatry. Run away, run as fast and far away as you can. You know, don't try to see how close you can get to the edge. Let's see how far away we can stay from any type of idolatry. You know, where, where anything comes before God. You know, first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, you know, and it may be it's just a personal conviction that I have, but, you know, I'm not going to get on uh, social media, even though part of me wants to see how many likes I got or whatever. You know, I'm not going to check my emails. I'm not going to look at the news because, you know, although there's part of me that's concerned about what happened yesterday, you know, first thing for me is God. And I don't know for sure if that's how it works for everybody. That's something between you and the Lord. But man, you know, that's one uh, kind of like one uh, way of saying what your master passion is, what gets you out of bed in the morning. You know, flee from idolatry where any person or position or possession or passion is, is your priority before God. You know, God should dominate our thoughts. We have to flee from it and run away Literally, in the Greek language, this word, it means run for your life. Sometimes I think people like to stay and they kind of hang out and they're like, I ain't no thing. No, flee. He says, run away. We're, we're guilty of idolatry anytime we put anyone or anything before the Lord. And it might not just be something you have. It might be something you want. 
Colossians verse three, chapter three, verse five, it says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, that's why whenever I would see a 67 uh, fastback Mustang, I would always turn the other way. way. Because I knew I was falling into idolatry. When I was a young uh, husband, and I, I wanted a 67 fastback so bad, I thought, man, I could make my kids sell lemonade. My wife can get a job, man. I want to get one of those things, you know? And so, you know, any, it could be something you have. It could be a person. At the end of the day, you love them more than you love the Lord. You know, um, it could be something you want, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And it's something that I think that really at the, at the end of the day is the main reason we struggle. Because we put ourselves before God. Or we put our girlfriend or our boyfriend before God. We can put our spouse or our children before God. We can put our house before God. We can put anything before God. It's crazy. We can put the dumb phone before God. And, you know, you spend more time with your phone, you know, six, seven, seven hours, hours, they say, in screen time. You're watching movies and stuff. You know, I don't, personally, and not, again, I don't want to preach my convictions, but how can you, like, watch a movie if you haven't even read your Bible that day? I don't understand how people can do things like that. To me, i got to hear from God first. He's the one that speaks into my life. And then maybe I'll watch a movie if it's clean with my family. But we have to be so careful. Flee. John, another guy who really loved the people, he said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And so he, he's telling them, flee from idolatry. Why is that? Well, many reasons, but we need to know that idolatry means that we're dealing, dabbling, and dancing with demons. Why, and, and I'll just say this, some of you here, you're struggling because there is a demonic presence in your life. You don't realize it. You know, as they talk, the Bible talks about how sometimes the, the enemy, enemy gets a foothold. Sometimes the enemy oppresses people. You guys know this, right? We believe in God. God is invisible. We can't see him with our eyes, but we know he's real, just as real as any other person. We believe in angels, right? Angels are real, and they rescue us, and they do so many amazing things. They're invisible. Do you also believe in demons? Demons are real. And, and what happens is that sometimes through idolatry, sometimes through ignorance, we open doors to demons. And there are demons in our life that have got a foothold. You know, look what Paul says in verse 15. I, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Now, he's going to eventually talk about how they would take the meat and they would go to the altar and they would sacrifice it to their demons. And he's going to talk about how there's a demonic connection there. But, but now he's saying, okay, you guys, just think this one through. Because we know that when we do these types of things, these types of sacrifices, these types of ceremonies, these types of offerings, that it's more than just like a, a merely physical thing. That there's a spiritual thing going on here. It's, it's fellowship. And he uses the example of communion. We're going to have communion today. When you uh, break the bread, it, it's not just bread. There's communion going on right here. This is the body of Christ, not transubstantiation, but there's a reality here. There's a spiritual experience with God, right? When you're breaking the bread and when, you're, when you have the cup, that, that cup of blessing, which was the fourth cup in the Passover meal, when, that was symbolic of the blood of Jesus. And what we're doing here is that when, whenever you would eat with anyone in this uh, culture, they knew it, and, and they knew it well, that you'd be one with, 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 that, with that people, right? So, you know, you're, you're breaking from the same loaf, and you're dipping in the same sauce. You're one. 
And so he's saying, you guys know this just as well as I do, that when we're having communion, that we are experiencing God. That there's a spiritual thing going on here. You're not just eating. There's a spiritual experience, right? You're opening your heart to, you're opening doors to God. And so he uses that there as Christians, right? But, but not only just, not only the, the church, the new covenant, we even see it in the old covenant, that under the, uh, the nation of Israel, look at verse 18, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? And so in those days, when you would take your, your sacrifice to the, the priest, um, there's different types of sacrifices. One was called a burnt offering, and you would take your offering, and they would burn everything. It would all be gone. And it was symbolic of a, a life that was just, uh, you know, burnt, man. It's all God's. I, I'm giving my whole life to God. But all the other offerings, the peace offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, all the other ones, there would be a portion that they would give, to, and they would, you know, a burn. But then there would be a portion that the priest would eat. And there would be a portion, even if it was a, if it was a fellowship offering, that you could eat. And so imagine uh, what it was like in the Old Testament, going to the tabernacle or going to the temple. You guys ever have barbecues? It smells good, huh? You know, the meat, it's there. You know, that's what it must have smelled like. It was like this crazy barbecue, right? And so some goes to God. A portion goes to the priests and their families and their sons and daughters. But then a portion you would eat as well. And so what he's saying right there is as you're eating that meat, he, he even says that you have to eat it in a special place. It's not just you eating meat. It's us fellowshipping with God. It's a spiritual experience. It's not just a, a physical thing. And he's just telling them, you guys, be, are, you guys are wise. Make a judgment about this. Communion is spiritual. When the Jews, the nation of Israel, offered their sacrifices, it was spiritual. We were, we were dealing with God, right? And, and so what ends up happening, Paul now makes the same thing true when they would offer their sacrifices to the pagan temples. Look, verse 19. What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. And so you go to a birthday party, and the birthday party is at a pagan temple. And they're at the pagan temple. You're present. Maybe you shouldn't even be there. But you're there, and then you're eating the meat that was sacrificed to, to demons, Paul says. Now, the, the idol, he's already established the fact that the idol is nothing. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, you know, that statue of, of Mary or that statue of whatever it is, Buddha, although they're, them, they're lifeless. The Bible talks about that. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have hands, but they can't, they can't use their hands. They have ears, they can't hear. They have mouths. They're on the statue, but they can't speak. So the idol itself is nothing. But the lie of Lucifer that's linked to the idol is. And what he's saying is that when they sacrifice to their idols, that they are sacrificing to demons. And what he's saying, if you go to a pagan uh, temple and you start eating that meat, you know, you're, you're dabbling with, you're dealing with, you're dancing with demons. And to me, that's too close for comfort. You know, what he's saying right here is, I do not want you, look again, to have, verse 20, to have fellowship with demons. And I know as a pastor, I know that that is part of the reason why a lot of people, even in the church, are, are thrashed because the devil, the demons, they have a stronghold on them. You know, even as Christians, that can happen. And so we have to be so careful that oppression, uh, we get close to those types of things. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I want to stay as far away from it as I can. 
You know, growing up, my aunt and uncle used to go to a restaurant called Red Devil Pizza. I don't know, man. <laughs> I just, I, and I think about it now, and it's not too far from where I live. I'm like, man, I wouldn't eat, I would never eat at a place called Red Devil Pizza. What, are they, what is the world trying to do? They're trying to make it seem like it ain't, it's no big deal, right? You go to Taco Bell, and they have the black sauce. It's called Diablo. Diablo. Now, I, my kids like that sauce. Pray for them. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Like, I will never have Diablo sauce, personally. And when I do go to Taco Bell for them, I don't ask for Diablo sauce. I'd say the one in the black package. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. And I, I'm, I just know that you have to be so careful because you can open doors to demons. Imagine someone you know, playing with an Ouija board. Okay, now an Ouija board is those games, and they're straight out about it. What they do is they just kind of open themselves to open themselves up to spirits, right? That's what they do. And if you wanted to, you could go and you can meditate over there. It doesn't even have to be at a Satan temple or whatever. It doesn't have to be at the fortune teller down the street. You can go anywhere and you can just open yourself up to spirits. And those demons would love to meet you there. You know, so I'm not going to take, you know, what does it say? They had an Ouija board and I'm not going to bring it home to my house. You know, and you might think, well, that's Manny. That's uh, mystical or, or whatever. That's superstitious. No, that, I'm just running as far away as I can from idolatry because I know that idolatry is linked to demons. That's what he's saying right here. You know, David Guzik, he said, Paul has already acknowledged an idol is nothing in the world in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. But does he now say that idols are actually demons? No. But he does say demonic spirits take advantage of idol worship to deceive and enslave people. Without knowing it, idol worshipers are glorifying demons in their sacrifice. You know, it's interesting to me because sometimes you have people who say that all religions are the same, that we're praying to the same God, just different names. So, you know, there you have these people praying to that idol and some would say, that's okay, God is kind of like this generic God, but... Paul informs us, no, they, they sacrifice to demons. And then what happens is such people, they find themselves in this funk, defeated by the enemy. I wonder how many people here, I mean, they just have a demonic presence in their life. Somewhere along the line, somewhere, maybe it was through drugs. You know, drugs, the Greek word is uh, pharmakia. Uh, we get our the English word sorcery. You know, you do you go you go smoke pot, you do crystal meth. You're opening doors to demons. I mean, there could be someone in here who has a demon in them, possessed by demons. I bet you there are people in here in church oppressed by demons, because you never really open your heart to the love of Jesus Christ. I mean, the devil's no match for God. Right? First John chapter 4, verse 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But you're no match for the devil. And if you find yourself in any way, in any way, distracted, you're not on track, you're not interested in spiritual things, you don't like reading your Bible, praying, going to church, you're not really interested in the Lord, then the devil has a foothold in your life. And so, it's very relevant, when I was thinking about this, how many people struggle with some form of idolatry or how many people are in the spiritual battle uh, literally against demons paul here in verse 21 he says you cannot drink the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the lord's table and of the table of demons or, or do we provoke the lord to jealousy or are we stronger than he you know, some people mistakenly think they can enjoy a spiritual smorgasbord, but the Bible teaches us that we can't, we cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve uh, two masters. Eventually, who you love most will be exposed. Do we dare to arouse the Lord's jealousy as the children of Israel did? 
I'm curious. I, I I don't know. Just to be funny, I wonder how many of you here, you ever had like, like two girlfriends at the same time. Some of you guys here, yeah, that was me, huh? You think you can do that to God? You think you can have like, yeah, God, I, my heart's yours, but my heart also is over here. I'll never forget the day that my girlfriend, I went to the mall and I saw her with another guy. I remember, you guys, you feel sorry for me, right, when I tell you. <laughs> but then imagine that's how the Lord sees it when we try, you know, to two-time him. The Lord will get jealous. He's a jealous God. The Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 5, You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a, am a jealous God. Right? God loves us and wants us exclusively for him. He doesn't want to share us with other gods, with other loves in our lives. He's jealous for us. Well, that's what we sang that song earlier, how he loves us. But God is, is jealous for us. As a matter of fact, God's love is so deep and his jealousy is so holy that that's one of his names. We read in Exodus thirty four fourteen, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. I wonder if there's any husbands here that are jealous. And, and then the wife is, she kind of likes it. <laughs> now, you can be over jealous, right? You know, and that, there's an unhealthy uh, aspect to it, right? That's more like possessiveness, right? But man, some guy starts coming up and flirting with your wife, and you know, you don't even care as a husband. You're like, oh, I'm secure, I ain't no thing. You know, I mean, no, it's good to show a little jealousy. You know, the other day we were at the, um, at the store and some guy, you know, we were getting some clothes for my son Aaron and my wife was helping him pick out his clothes. And, and you know, so she's talking to him and, you know, everything, getting her fashion wisdom. And uh, some guy kept coming out of the dressing room asking her, her what, he, what she thought of his, you know, way he's dressed. <laughs> I thought that was kind of weird because he did it like four times. I'm like, you know, it's good to have a, a little jealousy, right? So God is jealous for us. You guys, he, he deserves your heart. I remember one time there was this little kid. My, my, I was just so, my, man, he had one parent that was Buddhist, one parent that was Christian, and he went to a Christian school, and he told the teacher, well, this side of my heart belongs to Buddha. This side of my heart belongs to Jesus. So that's tough. You know, what we find, you guys, is God says, listen, uh, I'm, I'm jealous to the point, Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, says the Lord your God is a consuming fire, and he's a jealous God. And if you say you're a Christian and you start loving on someone else before the Lord, he is going to deal with you. So get ready. You know, with all that in our hearts, knowing this, aware of the doctrines of demons and the discipline of our Father, Paul tells us to flee from idolatry. And then he returns to the principles by which we are to live our lives. We go to that verse again in verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. And so, you know, all things are lawful. I can have 10 donuts every day. It's lawful, right? It's permissible for us as God's people. But that doesn't necessarily mean that eating 10 donuts every day is helpful just because it's legal. And this is important because here's the thing that's interesting. When you read the text carefully, Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, and the implication is for you. Now, it could be for me, too. Like, I, I want to do things that build me up. I think, my personal opinion is, because I think we watch too much television in this world, I personally think that you should be reading the Bible. I think it would be good for you to read other books, at least one book that you're going through, learning more about the Bible, learning more about what it means to be a godly husband or a godly wife or whatever, you know, the, the Christian lesson that you want to study. You know, it's good to, to read things that build you up. But, but here it's interesting. He says, no, every, I can do anything I want, but, but it's, it's lawful, it's legal, it's permissible. But not everything that I do is helpful for you. 
And that could be for me as a, as a husband, thinking of my wife, thinking of my kids, thinking of the church as a pastor. I mean, I'm telling you guys, man, I constantly think about what this decision would look like as the, as the church watches me. As a pastor, you live your life in a fishbowl, huh? And they're watching you. You know, I wanted to come up and wear a tank top. But I don't want to make you stumble, right? I wanted to get, like, the new, um, whatever, Corvette. But I just thought you guys might not. You have to, all the decisions that we make, right, it's always in consideration, deliberation. Lord, it's legal. I could do it if I wanted to. But, but would that be something that would be good for the people as they're watching my life? It's not just about me building myself up. It's about others, right? Don't think only of your own good. Think of other Christians and what is best for them. That's my life. That's our life now. You know, I mean, please, living for yourself is living on the doorsteps of hell. How are you living your life for others? That, that's one of the reasons why I tell people you have to discover what gifts you have in the body of Christ. You know, and don't bury those gifts because God gave you those gifts for the church. That's why it's important to be part of a church and, you know, okay, Lord, I'm part of this body. Are you the hand? Are you the arm? Or, or what, what part are you? Because if you're not functioning as part of the body, then something's missing, something's wrong. You know, it's not good. If everybody caught the vision, if everybody participated, if everybody, you know, exercised their gifts, discovered them, developed them, and deployed them, imagine how good it would be for others. We're living our life like this, right? And, and then we go back to the question the Corinthians asked back in, in chapter 8 and verse 1, can thing, concerning things offered to idols, look at verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. Now, it's interesting when you compare uh, this section to chapter 8, because this section, it seems to deal more with the non-believer now at this point right here. And so, you know, if you want to um, eat, you know, meat, Paul says it's okay. We know that after the flood, God allowed them uh, to eat meat. You guys can eat anything. Any of you here ever have tarantulas? You, it's okay to eat tarantulas. Some people eat monkey brains. Crazy things that people eat, huh? It's okay. You know, God gave it to us. Uh, Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, as long as you pray over it, you're good, right? And so um, it's all right. Um, you know, to eat it. If your non-believing friend invites you to come on over for carne asada tacos, you don't have to ask them where the meat came from. Just grub, right? And so here, Paul quotes from Psalm 24, verse 1. He says, the reason is the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness and the world and those who dwell therein. And so, um, you know, if you're visiting your friend, and sometimes we experience this on the mission field, just eat it. In the mission field, it's probably best not to ask, what is it? <laughs> I've been there, man. I've been there. But notice what he says in verse 28. If anyone says to you, well, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. And so he's trying to give them something that would be very practical in those days. Well, what if I'm in this situation? Your non-believing friend invites you over. You want to go. They serve you meat. You don't ask. You just grub. But then your non-believing friend, as they're serving you the meat, they say, hey, just to let you know, this meat was offered to idols. Now, Paul says, then don't eat it. Because your non-believing friend, even they know there's something kind of weird about this. There's his conscience sake. And like I said now, if you were to eat it, you would violate your non-believing friend's conscience. And so, you know, you have to be so careful as Christians, we can make someone as a Christian, you know, stumble or fall away. And even we have to be careful as Christians in the decisions that we make. 
because we can make someone who's on their way to being a Christian change their mind. That's how our whole life is lived. You know, you go to work and you say you're a Christian and you got the bumper sticker, but you flirt with girls. And that one guy who was interested in Christ finds out you're a Christian. Not anymore. He was on his way, but you made him stumble away. See, that's why the whole world is watching us, you guys. And so what he's saying is these are the, the principles. This is the situation that you, you're in. You know, you didn't investigate the matter, but they offer the information. Paul says, don't eat it. Consider their conscience. Consider them. And interestingly enough, he quotes the same passage, Psalm 24, verse 1. If we could show that verse again, it's an interesting verse because it says the earth is the Lord and all its fullness, right? And so that's what the Jews would use that verse to say we can eat anything almost except as long as it was kosher. But the, the second part of that says the world and those who dwell therein. So he uses it in both uh, ways. Now the second way, some, some people, people say the reason why he quotes that verse to support, you know, you not eating the meat is because you have other options. You can have, what's the mushroom called? The mushroom burgers? Portobello. Yeah, you don't need meat. You, need, you can have portobello, right? You can eat other things, right? Or other people say the reason he quotes the verse again is now he's not talking about food. He's talking about people. And now you make your decision not to eat the meat because of the people, the world, and those who dwell therein. Verse 29, conscience, I say not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? And, and more than likely what Paul is saying right here is, you know, this for their conscience that you don't eat the meat. Because if you did, you would be judged by them. If you did, they would talk about you. Yeah, that guy says he's a Christian, but, you know, they don't understand everything that you understand. And that's why we have to be very, very careful. Verse 31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Imitate me, he says in chapter 11, as I also imitate Christ. Now, when you look at this, this is not just a personal issue like vegetarian or vegan issues. This is beyond that type of thing. It's a spiritual issue meat offered to idols that has the capacity to make some people stumble. And so, again, we come back to this principle, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Eating meat, probably not going to be an issue for you guys, huh? But what about drinking? What about drinking? We don't have time to go there, but when you have a, a moment, read F Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 is almost a parallel principle of what we're seeing right here. And that, to me, is probably a more a relevant question. Like, is it okay to drink? Is it okay to drink? You know, I believe drinking alcohol in today's world where wine is probably nine times stronger than it was in Bible days, where over 10,000 people die every year through drunk driving, where 15 million United States American citizens are alcoholics and where 65 million Americans admit to being drink binging every single month, where 80% of all crimes committed by people are committed by people under the influence of alcohol. If a Christian drinks in light of all these things, I believe they can easily make someone stumble. And we talked about that. You're, you're a Christian, and you say you're a Christian, you're drinking, and your brother falls away. Because maybe you say, well, I can handle it. I have a beer, I have a, a glass of wine, a little shot of vodka, whatever it might be, but they can't handle it. I know what my dad did when he drank. 
And I know what I did when I drank. So, so here's this principle. Whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. You're, you're considering other people, right? If you really stretch it out, you might be able to say it's okay to, to, to drink. But, you know, when you look at Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, whoever is led by, astray by it is wise. When you look at the principle that we have here in 1 Corinthians, what we find is that, to me, it's a terrible choice to do that. In what we eat, in what we drink, and all that we do, let's not offend or ruin the, the Jew, and that might be the religious person, the Greek, and that might be the non-religious person, or our fellow brethren in the church. We think of everybody at the end of the day. Why? Because we want them to be saved. Just like Jesus, his whole life and his whole death was all about people getting saved. Huh? That's why Paul can say right there at the end, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Mimic me. The Greek word is mimetes. Mimic me, Paul says, as I also mimic Christ. God is going to use you guys. Isn't that amazing? Jesus came and he died on a cross and people got saved. And God is going to use you for people to get saved. That's amazing to me, you guys. It really is. And so you might even be here today and you don't know where you stand in your relationship with God. You know, if you're here and you have any hesitation, any question about it, the cool thing is God is here. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord. As he's knocking on the door of your heart, you say, yes, Lord, come in. You believe Jesus. You believe in him. And you watch what happens.